Sean Hook's Newsmaker Saturday starts now. Thanks for joining us on Newsmaker Saturday. Arizona could be on the verge of a major tax overhaul, instituting a flat income tax. We'd be one of about 13 states to do this. We're going to talk about that later in the program. But first, it took nearly a year, but Lori Vallow and her husband, Chad Daybell, are now charged with murdering her two children. Their bodies were unearthed on Daybell's Idaho property last June. Chad Daybell was also indicted on a charge of first degree murder and insurance fraud in the death of his then wife, Tammy Daybell. Fox 10 reporter Justin Lum has been on this case from the beginning. He joins us now outside of the federal courthouse. Justin, what a week. It took almost a year for the murder charges to be brought, but now we've got a pause again because Laura, Lori Vallow's mental competency has come into question. Could that delay this even longer? Well, it definitely is right now. Her case in Idaho is on hold. And first off, let's just recap what this week means. The culmination of so much, our coverage since 2019, December 2019. But this story goes back so much further and it's all just unraveled over the past year and a half. And now Lori and her husband, Chad Daybar, are both indicted in the murders of her two kids, JJ Vallo and Tylee Ryan, and his then wife, previous wife, Tammy Daybell. So this all just exploded this week. It has been a long time coming for the families of these victims who have been waiting for murder charges because think about it. Last summer, June 9th, the kids were finally found and their remains the whole time were in the backyard of Chad Daybell up in Idaho. And we had been wondering, are the kids safe? Are they, are they alive? Because they went missing in September of 2019. So that mystery going on for so many months and then for them to be found the way they were found in that gruesome way outside his house huh, in the backyard under his property and still no murder charges they were basically charged with conspiring together to conceal evidence and finally here we are this week may 24th those two were indicted in the deaths of jj and tylee and really tammy daybell that was such a mystery because we didn't know anything about her autopsy results they just came back that's Chad to the Fremont daybell's county sheriff's wife. office in idaho that's Exactly. And so he was married at the time in October 2019 when Tammy died. She was found dead inside her home. And this is a 49 year old woman, school librarian, very healthy, training for a marathon at the time. And she just turns up dead. Uh, and at that time was initialed a natural death. Yeah, it's a little but all things of it's, really unraveled. All of it's a little too convenient. It seems like when when Lori Vallow finally met Chad Daybell, he'd been writing these kind of end of times doomsday books that she'd been reading for the past maybe five, six years. Then she meets him and that's when the trail of death starts. Can you describe what Chad Daybell was writing about in those books that somehow lit the fuse in, in Lori Vallow. So here's the quick bio on Chad Daybell. Doomsday fictional author, claims to have had near-death experiences, claims to have visions like he's some sort of prophet, also a former grave digger, and so he's written these books over time, nearly 30 of them. And Lori Vallow was a big fan. She was reading these books maybe even since 2015, could go back further. So at the time they meet, it's now October 2018. And to give you the specific event, it's the Preparing a People Conference on October 26th in St. George, Utah. And basically the Preparing a People Conference is a series of lectures by speakers. And the whole point is to talk about the end of times, to prepare for the end of times and to be self-reliant. And Chad is one of the well-known speakers. So they finally meet. And then four days later, we broke this story, his email, to her email, there are documents between them, specifically from Chad, uh, detailing her, her family tree. The people in her family named as either light spirits or dark spirits, and you cannot make this up. He believes, according to the sources that we spoke to researching this document, trying to figure out what it meant, he believes he can evaluate the person's spirit as a light spirit or dark spirit, and then he'll grade them with numbers so you had all the people in her family the immediate family on this list and also he started sending documents of who he believed she was 
in her past lives. He believed, you know, in multiple probations, and and you graduate after each life um, as you die to to finally somehow become exalted. So these these are very unique spiritual beliefs. This is not the doctrine of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter Day Saints, and members of the church will tell you they don't believe in what. Chad was allegedly teaching to Lori, but once she starts getting these documents, everything evolves into January 2019, when Charles Vallow, we're going to get into her fourth husband, is really pleading for help right here in Arizona from Gilbert Police. That's where they were living at the time, trying to get her mentally evaluated. Yeah, you brought us up to speed on this, and I want to play the package from this week that you did uh, on the day that they were charged finally with murder. Here's Justin Lum's uh, piece from earlier this week. We want to express our deep appreciation for the efforts of the dozens of local, state, including Idaho Attorney General, federal law enforcement members, and Arizona law enforcement who have been working to gather evidence for a year and a half to bring justice to Tammy Daybell, Tylee Ryan, and J.J. Vallow. A major development in the long wait for justice, Chad Daybell, the former doomsday fictional author, charged with three counts of murder in connection to the deaths of J.J. Vallow, Tylee Ryan, and his first wife, Tammy. Lori Vallow, who married him shortly after Tammy died, is accused of murdering her own kids. Both Vallow and Daybell are also accused of conspiring to commit all three murders. I was really just trying not to, you know, set myself up for, like, a disappointment. Tylee's aunt, Annie Cushing, is staying optimistic. It's just been a jolt of confidence that they can go after Chad and Lori for all of the deaths. Prosecutors believe Vallo and Daybell endorsed religious beliefs to justify the murders. Court documents say they exchanged messages discussing death percentages for Tammy and JJ. Documents also say the couple believed Tammy had been possessed by a spirit named Viola. Vallow's late brother, Alex Cox, is accused of shooting at Tammy on October 9, 2019. A little more than a week later, investigators say he was in a church parking lot two and a half miles away from Tammy's home, where she was found dead the next day. Cox's cell phone data ultimately led authorities to the remains of JJ and Tylee last June. Cushing is relieved by long-awaited murder charges. Yeah, I mean, you still carry that that weight of... They suffered a lot leading up to their murders. Vallow is also accused of grand theft. Investigators say she never reported J.J. and Tylee's deaths to the SSA, but instead collected Social Security survivor benefits on behalf of the children for months. Daybell is also charged with two counts of insurance fraud, accused of increasing Tammy's life insurance to the maximum the policy allowed just a month before she died. A statement from Tammy's parents and siblings reads in part, we pray that truth will prevail and that all of us left behind will find a way to pick up the pieces and somehow come out of this crucible together. Justin, I wanna show something that it it is a very hard case to follow. We're gonna put up a little picture of your war room that shows the twisted relationships and everybody connected. But what you will see in that photo is that all roads lead back to Chad Daybell and Lori Valla. All the trail of death leads right back to them. Justin, is it prosecutors' theory that they were pretty much eliminating anybody who got in their way of of them living a life together and then doing what? Well, when you read the indictment, basically prosecutors are saying they were using these religious beliefs to justify these murders and I want to take you back to that nugget from that indictment prosecutors have text messages between Chad and Lori where they are talking about his wife Tammy being possessed by a spirit named Viola it sounds wild right that was in July 2019 Lori and the kids hadn't even left Chandler Arizona that was just weeks after her husband Charles Vallow had been shot and killed by her own brother Alex Cox and he's now dead and Alex claimed self-defense so they were already talking about uh, death percentages during these text messages they were talking about her being possessed and back to Charles same thing in the divorce paperwork he filed he said to his lawyers that Lori accused him of being a dark spirit by the name of Nick or Ned Schneider basically saying you are not Charles anymore you are not my husband you are now a dark spirit and what the alleged beliefs are coming from Chad is that 
if a dark spirit has possessed your body, you are now a zombie. And basically for you to, your original spirit to be out of limbo, you know, you basically need to be taken care of. So to wow. answer your question, these are based on beliefs that, you know, we can't fathom. You right. can't make this up in, in, in your own head. And if you can, then that's a whole another yeah. issue but, uh, but it's happened between other, these two yeah it's happened in other cults before where you know you yeah. look back on it and you say how in the world did anybody believe this justin the, the the person in this that's interesting is Lori vallow's brother alex cox he seems to be involved in a lot of this of course he's dead now um did he put the hit on Lori vallow's husband are you talking about charles vallow because Yes. She's now in husband number five. No, I know. I know that. Two no, of her Charles Vallow two, yeah, dies. Two, yes. Two of her husbands are dead. I know. Did Alex Cox, yeah. did that so, whole idea of self-defense, police now think that that's a whole different deal, right? Well, Alex claimed self-defense because he says Charles hit him in the head with a baseball bat. And just so people know, Charles played minor league baseball, college baseball. He was a fit man. And this was a metal baseball bat, allegedly. If Charles were to hit Alex Cox in the back of the head, you would think he would at least be unconscious, but he was able to call 911 after the shooting. And so it's hard for family members of Charles Vallow to ever believe this. They really don't buy the self-defense claim yeah. at all. And Chandler police have never called it self-defense. They kept investigating. And now this, uh, now this case is now in the hands of the Maricopa County Attorney's Office accusing Lori Vallow of conspiracy to commit murder. It's um, incredible. So now it's going to be in the hands of MCAO to make this charging decision right. or not. Okay. Justin Lum, I appreciate it. We're going to have you back as this continues to unfold, this saga. When we come back on Newsmaker Saturday, the flat tax. We'll talk to the governor's chief of staff about it. Who it helps, who it hurts. Back in a moment. Welcome back on Newsmaker Saturday. Governor Doug Ducey and state lawmakers have proposed a 2.5% flat income tax in this state that could cut state revenues by $1.5 billion. That's the rub. The state House and Senate are working toward a vote on a final budget agreement in the coming days. Governor Ducey's Chief of Staff, Daniel Scarpinato, joins us now to talk about this. Daniel, good to see you. Hey, John, it's great to see you. Okay, Daniel, uh, flat tax. This is right out of the Steve Forbes playbook, uh, circa <laughs> 2000. What's the story here? Who benefits, who loses? Well, the governor believes Arizonans benefit and particularly working families and our small businesses. If we don't act, small businesses will be facing a 77.7% .7 uh, tax increase. And also the state is flush with resources right now. Our economy is booming. If we don't do anything, the state's gonna have a $4 billion surplus over the next three years. That's a third of our entire state budget. Let's give some of that money back to the hardworking taxpayers. Let's start with the part about the 75% tax increase. That is assuming that Prop 208 is approved by the Arizona State Supreme Court because they're litigating it, they're looking at it right now on whether that's an up or down. Voters passed it, but that is a onerous tax on people who make over about $500,000. I mean, it, it raises their taxes about 75%. That goes for a lot of small businesses too. That's what you're referring to, right? It, yeah, that would really hit a lot of our small businesses. Uh, and small businesses are the lifeblood of Arizona's economy. Over 99% of businesses in Arizona our small businesses. There's a lot of uncertainty around that. Uh, and what's great about this plan is it really protects what voters voted on. They were told by the proponents of Prop 208 that there would be no impact on small businesses. And they also wanted additional money for K-12. This allows us to protect small businesses, make sure that they don't see that steep increase in their taxes and also make sure the dollars continue to flow to k-12 education it's all protected in here in addition to additional investments and john on top of that k-12 education has received four billion dollars in federal dollars over the last year which is almost four thousand dollars per student over and above what the state's investing 
So we feel really good about the continued investments in K-12, but we also know with that uncertainty, we want to make sure that those small businesses you know, know what's coming, know what to plan for. And a lot of these small businesses, John, have been really hard hit over the past year uh, with COVID. You know, small businesses like restaurants and, and barber shops, uh, you know, you know what people have been through. Yeah, let's, let's, let's back up for a second. Philosophically for the governor, despite the broadsides from Dan- Donald Trump uh, that you're well aware of, he is a very conservative guy fiscally conservative. So is this his way to shrink government? In other words, to starve government a little bit and say, you don't want to just have government endlessly collecting money because government gets bigger and bigger by extension. Well, yeah, I mean, but the way I guess the way I would put it, John, is the governor ran twice and was elected twice and by a larger margin the second time on a pledge to drive down our income tax. He was very clear about that. And yeah, he also talked about reducing the size of government and we have, we have less state employees today than when the governor came into office despite record population growth. We want smart government. We want government that serves the people well and responsibly, but that doesn't mean big government. So let's make sure that we're making those investments that people care about, like K-12 education, higher education, infrastructure, those uh, elements, the social safety net. But where we have additional dollars over and above that, there's no reason why we would want to keep that sitting in government coffers rather than getting it back to the people who have earned that money. And unfortunately, yeah, there's some out there that want to just keep increasing taxes so that they can get more spending in the budget. Now, now, when we talk about doing this flat tax, you've got about nine other states, mostly East, uh, you know, Rust Belt and Eastern Seaboard that have a flat tax. It's been done before. 33 states, including Arizona, have graduated income tax rates. Seven states have no income, state income tax. We are competing in reality against the Texas of the world, right? So this is a way to get the rate, the income tax rate, more competitive to attract business? Is that part of the equation? 100%. Look, the reason that we're even in this position where we have the opportunity to do this is because of the growth that we're seeing in our economy, the jobs, the record population growth. But Daniel, what if it goes the other way? I mean, you kind of back yourself into a corner, don't you, with a flat uh, income tax It's great now while we're flush with cash, but what if we hit speed bumps in the road? They're talking about a billion five, a billion and a half dollar shortfall that this would create on on the revenue side. Well, John, I would say, what if we don't act? All this does is keeps us in line with Colorado, not to mention the other states you named that we're competing with, like Texas and Nevada and Utah. These are places that we we need to be attracting people and jobs from. If we don't pass this, we're in a dynamic atmosphere. We got to keep Arizona competitive, but we have structured this in a very responsible way. You remember the early 2000s where spending was through the roof. We had double digit, sometimes 20 percent increases in spending. We're not doing that. We're below the 30 year average. We're being very conservative with our revenue estimates. But you know as well as I do what will happen. If we don't return money to the taxpayers, it's going to get spent. Well, that is that is kind of the government way. There's no there's no question about that. Could you even do this had a couple of years ago you guys not gotten this tax on e-commerce for a long time? You know, you had brick and mortars in town paying the freight but the e-commerce companies weren't paying anything. That's all changed. That's been a windfall for the state, right? Oh, absolutely. That has been a a windfall far exceeding any expectations or calculations. We also have uh, tribal gaming, which we just uh, renegotiated that that compact to include sports betting. What we've done is we've really broadened the base where we have a lot more revenue streams coming in at all levels, local, all the way up to the state. And so, yeah, this is structured in a way that's very different than what some other states have done, where they they just did everything across the board. We're seeing additional revenue streams come in. 
which allows us to do this and and like I said, remain competitive. We've we've in order to see this continued economic growth, we have to make sure that we're continuing to to update and be competitive with other states because they're doing the same thing. Daniel, they're the, they're looking at ways to to be more competitive with us. The people fighting this, one of the big one of the big groups fighting it are cities and uh, who get revenue from the state because they can't tax income. Cities can't do that. They get fifteen percent of the state income tax receipts. They are saying they will be absolutely leveled. Phoenix talked about it would cut their revenue from the state by a third, and they're saying it would lead to massive cuts in what they can deliver to their citizens. How do you guys respond to that? That it's ridiculous. Phoenix is the fastest growing city in the country and the fastest growing county in the country and one of the fastest growing states in the country. There's record revenue that's that's coming in. Their budget will be larger next year than this year and larger the year after and the year after that. The economist that was hired by the, the lobbying organization on behalf of, of Phoenix and the other big cities actually said if we don't act if we don't do this cities will lose out on uh, 2.4 billion dollars over the next several years so uh you know we really want to make sure we're working with our our mayors with our our smaller uh communities to make sure that that they're being protected in all of this but in terms of our big cities i mean john we the governor really made a point of ensuring that we took a light touch during COVID-19. A lot of these big cities wanted to shut down all of their small businesses and, and put people out of work. And despite their best efforts, we've got a booming, growing economy. Yeah, that's and the governor the, wants to keep that going. It's curious how it happened. This turned out to be a boom revenue year, and you would have never thought it. Let me ask you. There is also this argument that the top 20 percent would see 91 percent of the reduction in income taxes. Now, I guess the dirty little secret there is the 20 percent, the top 20 percent pay the lion's share of all the income tax in the state. So it's not surprising that they would get the benefit. But for people who say this this hurts, that it's uh, regressive, that it hurts the poor, it's going to hurt the middle class. What's your take? Our take, Governor Ducey's take, is that you got to look at the whole package. Just in terms of the income tax reductions, for the average Arizona taxpayer, it's a 13% reduction in what they pay. That's $350 back in their pocket every year. And that doesn't count the other things that are part of the tax package, like increasing unemployment insurance, like additional dollars for affordable housing, making sure that our veterans, it's Memorial Day weekend, our veterans who have served our country honorably get to keep their income and not be taxed on their pension. All of these are things that make this a, a package, a child tax credit. Uh, these are things that really round this out and make sure that it is focused on working families, and on small businesses and on people who are doing the work. Government has record revenue. If you are a barber or a waiter or waitress, I can guarantee you, you do, those folks do not have record revenue after the year that we've been through. Let's let them keep more of the money that they earn. Okay, Daniel Scarpinato, appreciate it. The governor's chief of staff, and you should all know, you probably used to read his stuff in the Arizona Republic. He was once uh, part of the the media, whatever that means nowadays. Daniel, great to see you, and uh, we'll have you back and um, give the governor our best, and we'll see you uh, next time. We appreciate it. Great. Thanks, John. I really appreciate it. Good to Daniel see you. Daniel Scarpinato, good to see you. And uh, we want to let you know, if you want to pass on the program to someone or you want to, uh, at future time, view it, here's where you go. Fox10Phoenix.com backslash newsmaker, and you can find past shows there. And we've had a lot of requests for this because people who forget to set their DVR or can't uh, stay up that late, they can't see it. We're back in a minute on Newsmaker Saturday. Thanks as always for joining us on Newsmaker Saturday. If you'd like to reach out to me, it's very easy. You can reach me at John Hook Fox 10 on Facebook and Twitter.
That's it for this program. We will see you next week on Newsmaker Saturday.